The Forbidden Game by L. J. Smith. Read for you by Sarah Hamilton. Book One, The Hunter. For Peter, who has both feet firmly on the ground, thank heavens. With special thanks to John Devola for lending some of his extraordinary photographs to Zach. Chapter One. Jenny glanced back over her shoulder. They were still behind her, on the other side of the street, but definitely following. They matched their pace to hers. When she slowed to pretend to look in a store window, they slowed too. There were two of them, one dressed in a black t-shirt and leather vest with a black bandana on his head, the other in a long flannel shirt, black and blue plaid, unbuttoned, also unwashed. They both looked like trouble. The game store was a few blocks ahead. Jenny quickened her pace a little. This wasn't the best neighborhood in town, and she'd come here specifically because she didn't want any of her friends to see her. She hadn't realized, though, that Eastman Avenue had gotten quite so rough. After the last riots, the police had cleared things up, but many of the vandalized stores still had boarded windows, which gave Jenny a creeping feeling between her shoulder blades. They were like bandaged eyes turned towards her. Not at all the place to be at dusk, but it wasn't dusk yet, Jenny told herself fiercely. If only those two guys would turn off onto another street. Her heart was beating unpleasantly hard. Maybe they had turned. She slowed again, her feet in their lace-up canvas tretorns, making no sound on the dirty sidewalk. From behind and to the left, she heard the flat smack of running shoes and the clack of boot heels. The footsteps slowed. They were still there. Don't look back, she told herself. Think. You have to cross over to Joshua Street to get to the store, but that means crossing left to their side of the street. Bad idea, Jenny. While you're crossing, they can catch up to you. All right, then. She turned off before that. She'd go right on this next street up here. What was it? Montvideo. She'd go right on Montvideo, and then she'd find a store to duck into, a place to hide until the two guys had passed by. The town records on the corner of Eastman and Montevideo was no longer in business. Too bad. Back street, stubbornly pretending she was perfectly calm, Jenny walked by the darkened windows. She caught a glimpse of herself in one of them, a slender girl with hair that Michael had once said was the color of honey and sunlight. Her eyebrows were straight, like two decisive brushstrokes, and her forest green eyes were dark as pine needles and even more serious than usual. She looked worried. She turned right at the cross street. As soon as she was out of sight of Eastman Avenue, she stopped and stood still as a deer, backpack swinging from her hand, eyes desperately scanning Montevideo for cover. Directly opposite her was a vacant lot, and beside that a Thai restaurant, closed. Behind her, the looming bulk of the record store presented a blank wall to the street all the way down to the park. No cover. Nowhere to hide. Jenny's neck prickled, and her little fingers began to tingle. She turned toward Eastman and hugged the wall, tossing back her hair to listen. Were those footsteps or just the sick thudding of her own heart? She wished that Tom were here. But of course, that was the whole point. Tom couldn't be with her, since it was his party she was shopping for. It was supposed to have been a pool party. Jenny Thornton was known for her pool parties, and here in Southern California, late April was a perfectly reasonable time to have one. The temperature often hovered in the mid-70s at night, and the Thornton pool glowed like a huge blue-green jewel in the backyard, giving off little wisps of steam from its surface. The perfect setting for an outdoor barbecue. Then three days ago, the cold snap had come, and Jenny's plans were ruined. Nobody except polar bears swam in this kind of weather. She'd meant to rethink things, to come up with some other brilliant idea, but it had been one of those weeks. Summer's 14-year-old schnauzer had finally had to be put to sleep, and Summer had needed Jenny for moral support. Dee had taken a kung fu exam, and Jenny had gone to cheer her on. Audrey and Michael had had a fight, and Zach had had the flu, and then suddenly it had been Friday afternoon with just hours to go before the party, and everyone expecting something special, and nothing set up. Fortunately, an idea had come to her in the middle of computer application class. A game. People gave murder mystery parties and Pictionary parties and things like that. 
why not a game tonight? It would have to be a very special game, of course. Something chic enough for Audrey, sexy enough for Tom, and even scary, if possible, to keep Dee's interest. Something seven people could play at once. Vague notions had run through Jenny's head of the only really exciting game she'd ever played as a child. Not the ones the adults arranged, but the kind you devise on your own once they were safely out of the house. Truth or dare, or spin the bottle. Some combination of those two. Only more sophisticated, of course, more suited to juniors in high school, would be ideal. That was what had brought her to Eastman Avenue. She knew perfectly well it wasn't the best neighborhood, but she'd figured that at least none of her friends would see her and find out about the last-minute scramble for entertainment. Jenny had gotten herself into this mess. She would get herself out of it. Only now the mess was getting bigger than she'd bargained for. She could definitely hear footsteps now. They sounded very close and were approaching quickly. Jenny looked down Montevideo again, her mind taking in irreverent details with obsessive precision. The record store wall was not truly blank after all. There was a mural on it, a mural of a street that looked much like Eastman Avenue before the riots. Strange, parts of the mural looked real. Like that storefront painted in the middle, the one with the sign Jenny couldn't quite make out. It had a door that looked real. The handle seemed three-dimensional. In fact, startled, Jenny took a step forward. The knob appeared to change shape as she moved, like any three-dimensional object. She looked more closely and found she could see the difference in textures between the wooden door and the painted concrete wall. The door was real. It couldn't be, but it was. There was a door stuck in the middle of the mural. Why, Jenny didn't know. There wasn't time to wonder about it. Jenny needed to get off the street, and if the door was unlocked... Impulsively, she took hold of the knob. It was cool as china, and it turned in her hand. The door swung inward. Jenny could see a dimly lit room. One instant of hesitation, then she stepped inside. Just as she did, she consciously took in the sign above the door. It read, More Games. Chapter 2 There was a push-button lock on the inside doorknob, and Jenny depressed it. There was no windows looking out on Montevideo, of course, so she couldn't see whether the two guys had followed her. Still, she had a tremendous feeling of relief. No one was going to find her in here. Then she thought, more games? She had often seen signs reading more books in the arty, shabby, used bookstores around here. Signs with an arrow pointing up a narrow staircase to another floor. But how could there be more games when there hadn't been any games at all yet? Just the fact that it happened to be a game store she'd stumbled onto was strange, but very convenient. She could do her shopping while she waited for the tough guys to go away. The owner would probably be glad to have her, with that mural camouflaging the door. They couldn't do much business here. As she looked around, she saw just how strange the store really was. Even stranger than the usual odd shops around Eastman Avenue. The room was lit by one small window and several old-fashioned lamps with stained glass shades. There were shelves and tables and racks like any other store, but the objects on them were so exotic that Jenny felt as if she'd stepped into another world. Were they all games? They couldn't be. Jenny's mind filled suddenly with wild images from the Arabian Nights, images of foreign bazaars where anything, anything, might be sold. She stared around at the shelves in amazement. God, what a weird chessboard. Triangular. Could anybody really play on a board like that? And there was another one with strange squat chessmen carved of rock crystal. It looked more than antique. It looked positively ancient. So did a metalwork box covered with arabesques and inscriptions. It was made of brass or maybe bronze decorated with gold and silver and Arabic writing. Whatever was in that box, Jenny knew she couldn't afford it. Some of the games she could identify, like the mahogany mahjong table with ivory tiles spilled carelessly on the green felt top. Others, like a narrow enameled case crawling with hieroglyphics and a red box embossed with a gold star of David in a circle she had never seen before. There were dice of every size and description, some twelve-sided, some shaped like pyramids, and some ordinary cubicle ones made of odd materials. 
There were card decks fantastically colored like illuminated manuscripts. Strangest of all, the weird antique things were intermixed with weird ultra-modern things. A cork bulletin board on the back wall sported signs reading, Flame, Rant, Rave, Surf the Edge, Cheap Thrills, Cyberpunk, Jenny thought, vaguely recognizing the terms. Maybe they sold computer games here too. From a boombox on the counter came 120 beat a minute acid house music. This, thought Jenny, is a very peculiar place. It felt so cut off from everything outside, as if time didn't exist here or ran differently somehow. Even the dusty sunlight slanting in that one window seemed wrong. Jenny would have sworn the light should have been coming from the other direction. A chill went through her. You're mixed up, she told herself, disoriented, and no wonder after the day you've had, after the week you've had. Just concentrate on finding a game if there's anything here that you can actually play. There was another sign on the board, a sort of square. Welcome to my world. Jenny tilted her head, examining it. What did the letter say? Oh, of course. She had it now. Welcome. Can I help you? The voice spoke from right behind her. Jenny turned and lost her breath.